My name is Blake Barker, and I am recording the oral history of John Fulby for the LGBT Center. Um, so if I could have you consent to an interview, that would be fantastic. I do consent to fantastic. it. Fantastic. And if I can have you sign right here before we get started. That would be great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, so if you could introduce yourself, um, your name, age, a little bit about where you grew up. Sure. I'm John Foley. I'm 66 years old. I was born November 25th, 1947 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and lived in Pittsburgh until I was 25, um, moved to Harrisburg in 1975, and shortly after that started getting involved with the gay community here. Can you tell me a little bit about your family? Sure. I have, uh, both of my parents are deceased. My father just recently passed away. He's 94 years old um, when he died two months ago. I have four siblings. I'm the oldest. Um, grew up in a very strict Roman Catholic, Irish, Italian family with lots of um, expectations that each child would eventually get married and procreate and add lots of babies, <laughs> which did not happen with me. <laughs> uh, so that's actually played a big part of growing up um, because of that. I could never, from the time I was very young, knew something that was different. Uh, that I really wasn't attracted to girls, but yet there was an expectation I would date, I would go to functions with girls and take them out and go to proms and all of the typical stuff that you do when you're in school. And so I did it really just to please my parents more than me. Um, and it was a strict, strict household. How do you identify amongst the LGBT community? Absolutely gay. Um, when did you realize that you were gay? Well, very early on when I was young, but I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was called. One thing I wish had existed when I was growing up were student LGBT groups um, because there are kids now that are in junior high, grade school even that are able to talk to someone if they're feeling they might be gay or lesbian or bisexual. And I, I think that's amazing. So I didn't really know what to call it or what it was and just felt different for years and years until I started college. And I met someone in college who said to me, you should read this book. And it was a novel or biography of a guy in California I think his name was Richie, and the name of the book was The Sexual Outlaw. And it was about all of his sexual exploitations in San Francisco, in Golden Gate Park and other parks around San Francisco. And by reading that book, I started to learn more about gay lifestyle, even though he was a hustler. It was still one aspect of gay life. And after reading that book, the guy who suggested I read the book started introducing me to friends in Pittsburgh in his network. And bit by bit, I met people and started dating and going out and feeling a lot more comfortable about my preference. Um, when did you come out to your friends and family? I, <laughs> friends, I did not come out to all of my friends. Um, there were friends in college I came out to. I did not come out to any of my siblings. I did not come out to my parents. Although my parents, I did come out to my parents years and years later. Um, and it was by accident. <laughs> and my parents had a habit of popping in unexpectedly without calling. And they were on their way back to Pittsburgh from Atlantic City and thought, well, we'll pop into Harrisburg overnight and they popped in. I had a stack of pornographic magazines on the bed in the guest bedroom that I, I didn't know anybody was coming. 
And um, I came into the house, and my mother immediately said, can we talk? I said, sure, what do you want to talk about? She said, I found these on the bed and took them off of the bed before your dad went into the, to the guest room. And I said, if you're sure you want to talk about it, yes, absolutely, we'll talk about it. So we went outside to the patio and sat for a few hours and talked about it. What was interesting to me is my mom started to say, well, is Mark gay? Is Tony gay? Is Jeff gay? All of my friends she had ever met, or she and my dad had ever met, she just assumed then they were all gay. And I just said, I don't know. I've never slept with them, so I don't know what their sexual preference is. And I finally said, it's really none of your business or my business. You know, if you want to ask them that, fine, but I'm not going to out them if, if they happen to be gay. My dad never, ever, ever talked about it. Never acknowledged it, never discussed life. it my whole life. And when he died two months ago, that was one thing that I really, well, I, I still am angry about it. And someone said to me, you have to remember your dad was 94 years old. His generation, that was something if a son to be gay or a daughter to be gay, you just didn't talk about it. You didn't address it. And you're lucky maybe if you had told him, he may have kicked you out of the house. And he might have. I don't know. Or my mother might have intervened. Uh, my mom never really cared. I met my partner when I was 20 years old. So we've been together a really long time. So my parents knew I'd lived with another guy, but never really questioned it, or we were roommates. Um, and, and it was funny because our first apartment was a one-bedroom apartment with twin beds that were pushed together. And when my partner's parents or my parents would come to visit, the beds were pushed apart immediately with a nightstand between them. So I was playing this game of, oh yeah, we're just roommates in a one-bedroom apartment. We share the bedroom. So after but, you kind of came out to your mom, did your siblings find out after that? Not right away, not until they were a little older because the, there's a 17 year difference between me and my youngest sibling. And so I thought there's no reason to tell her or discuss it with her. And my siblings, we've never really sat and talked about it. They know that I'm gay, they know I'm in a relationship, and two of them are fine with them and two of them are very homophobic. Not just with me, any LGBT person, they just, they cannot wrap their brain around it or accept it. It's just not a, a lifestyle that they want to acknowledge or affirm, so they don't talk about it. How has that affected your relationship with them? We're not really close, and, and I do get angry, and I do speak up if I hear them say anything negative or prejudiced or biased about LGBT community. I will let them know that, no, I don't want to hear it around, around me. If you want to keep it to yourselves, fine, but not, not when you're in our home. You're not going to do that. Or even if we're at a, a family wedding reception or some event, um, they, I, they just don't get it. They don't want to get it, and, and that's fine with me. I don't need them to get it, so. How did your friends react? What was the impact that it had on your friends? Well, in school, in college, it wasn't a big deal. Uh, there were a few people that thought it was just disgusting. And I used to think, well, they're not really my friends to begin with, because in my opinion, your friends have no faults. That includes sexual preference or identity. And if that's who you are and what you are, fine. You're fine, you're my friend. Um, when I started to work after college, it was for a large department store in Pittsburgh, and I was part of the visual merchandising team, and probably 80% of us were gay and lesbian. So working with that group of people was instant recognition of your choice and instant acceptability of your choice. So that wasn't a problem, and a lot of people in retail I learned were gay or lesbian, and a lot of the manufacturers' representatives that we worked with were LGBT. 
and, and I probably started learning more about gay after college when I started working because it was just this enormous universe of people. I mean, I couldn't get over how many gay people there were and lesbians, so it was interesting. What prompted you to move from Pittsburgh to central Pennsylvania? My partner. Okay. Um, we had been together for a few years. He was offered a job with state government and said, I've been offered a job. Would you like to come with me to Harrisburg? And I really agonized. I didn't answer him right away because I thought, I just started this job. I really like it. I like the people I work with. I'm learning a lot. It's a good beginning great experience, and the store that I worked for, Kaufman's department store, was really well known in the city, and um, I had amazing bosses when I worked at Kaufman's. Um, my first boss in the men's division was very, very uptight, heterosexual guy. <laughs> he knew his staff was gay, but he, he just kind of put his blinders on, and as long as we were doing a good job, he didn't need to deal with our preferences. And every once in a while, he would make a wise comment about it. Um, but it wasn't too bad. But I had phenomenal mentors. So I liked my job. Didn't know, do I want to give this up and move to central Pennsylvania? This relationship may or may not endure. Because I did know one thing that a lot of times uh, LGBT relationships don't endure, that they can be a very short-lived situation. So I thought about it for months. He had already moved here and started to work, and I was still in Pittsburgh, and then one day I thought, why not? I'm 25, I have nothing to lose. It's going to be terrific, or it's going to be awful. So packed up the apartment, moved here, and um, we've been together over 44 years. And what was it like moving here? Definitely culture shock. Uh, I think Pittsburghers are very open uh, to strangers. You can be standing in line for a movie or at the grocery store, bus stop, and people will just chat. They don't want to know your whole history, but they'll just chat. They'll talk about the snow or the fact that they're freezing or Maybe the Pirates had a great season, or maybe the Steelers had a great season. People just chat about things. Um, people don't do that here. They're very, I think, very conservative, um, not receptive to strangers or outsiders. Uh, as a matter of fact, my partner had a phenomenal professor um, when in undergraduate school. And she did her uh, graduate work in the area and she taught human growth and development. And one day when she was here visiting, I said, Margaret, I don't get these people. I don't, just don't understand it. And she said, you have two things going on here. Central Pennsylvania is Pennsylvania Dutch. It is a very close-knit, very tight group of people. They are not receptive to outsiders. The other thing that's going on is it is the capital of the state. People who tend to have really good friendships and relationships know that it takes work to sustain a friendship. If you're someone's friend, you deal with or whatever goes with that person, you become part owner of that to, to keep the friendship. And she said, people in state government tend to change every four years with the administration. So people don't want to invest time in a friendship because they think, why bother being a friend? You're going to leave in four years when the administration changes. And so it was hard even making friends in the gay community because most of the people in the gay community I did become friends with are all transplanted from some other city. Very few of them were natives. I've, I've since learned people met people and hang out with people who did grow up here. But, but most of my LGBT friends are other cities and states. And it's funny how many of them are Pittsburghers. 
that we kind of just found one another, but it was, it was serendipitous. Yeah. So what was the LGBT community like when you moved here? Well, I started meeting people because of a friend in Pittsburgh who had a lot of friends here because he had lived here at one point. And he called them and said, call John, take him out for drinks, start to introduce him to people. And so Milan did that. He would pick me up on Friday nights. We would go out for drinks with him. He would introduce me to people. In the meantime, I was starting to feel really guilty that I had strayed away from my Catholic upbringing and thought, I really liked being Catholic. I liked the ritual. I liked going to Mass. I liked the philosophy of it. Um, I liked the doctrine. And heard about a group in downtown Harrisburg called Dignity that was for gay Catholics. And I thought, that's really interesting. That appeals to me. So I went downtown, uh, called this priest who kind of facilitated the group. His name was Father Saadi. Called Father Saadi. Can I come talk with you? Yes. And he would say Mass for a group of gay and lesbian people on Sundays at um, the Friends Meeting House in downtown Harrisburg. So I started meeting other people who were gay and Catholic. And from that um, group, there was a volleyball team that I started to play volleyball with for about four years. And th that was the beginning of making really good friendships here that I've, I've had ever since. 19. Does that group still exist? Um, a fragment of it. The volleyball team is no more. Um, but there's a, a group of about 20 people, and out of that group of 20 that still network, once a month they have a potluck dinner at someone's home, and once a month they go out to dinner somewhere. And so it's, it's a social thing more than a religious organization. Were there, were there other places that you socialized in the community to meet people? Uh, the bars because of the, the friends who introduced me to friends here, they would go to the bars. The volleyball group, it was really funny. Every Tuesday night after volleyball, we would go to one of the bars. And usually the bars in Harrisburg were not real busy on a Tuesday night. And once word got out that, well, there were, this volleyball team came into the bar every Tuesday, the bar started getting crowded. Uh, the bar owners loved it because we were attracting business <laughs> and it was fun because after volleyball we would order 10 or 12 pizzas and take them with us to the bar and whoever happened to be there we would just say hey help yourself have pizza and stuff what i didn't know until recently was the bars in harrisburg never really started to be a safe place to go until the mid-70s um, and there, there's a man involved with the History Project who's been supporting it, who has amazing stories about the bars that I just took for granted. Because by the time we moved here and I started going to the bars, it seemed as though they had been there forever. But they hadn't. They were still fairly new to the community. So to me it was interesting. Um, there were other places in town aside from the bars people would go to meet. I didn't go to those places. I would just, you know, stayed with my volleyball group and had fun with them and would hang out with them and entertain them here. Uh, one thing about our, my partner and me is I'm very much, I don't know if it's because of my family background and growing up, I love having friends come for dinner. I love to cook, love to have company. Um, he's the complete opposite. Very quiet. It could, I mean, when people are here, he's cordial and nice and gracious and a, and a terrific host, but would never, ever say to people, I'll come for dinner Saturday night. <laughs> Just could not be bothered. So a lot of my friends um, come here. You know, we'll just invite them here to hang out and... How did you feel that the larger Harrisburg community were they receptive to the LGBT community at the time? No, I didn't think so. And, and that was just really based on listening to people talk and the kinds of things 
people talked about. And when we first, when I first moved here, I moved here without a job. And that was not a big deal to my partner. It was okay with him. So I did all kinds of things just to have an income. Um, I worked as a stylist for an advertising agency, doing catalog work. Um, I worked doing stenciling. I would design stencils and stencil people's kitchens and bathrooms and living rooms and family rooms. Uh, I worked as, at one point as a waiter and discovered what a really tough job that is to be a white person. People can just be horrible. <laughs> I mean, that's a rough job. Or even owning a restaurant is a rough job. Uh, I also discovered there were a lot of gay people in the food service industry. Um, but just observing people's conversations, listening to people, I learned it was still a pretty uptight community as far as LGBT. Mm -hmm. When did you decide to get involved in activism? Probably I became a real activist when I started working with the Gay Switchboard. I was a volunteer for the Gay Switchboard. What is that? It was a hotline that um, I think Barry Loveland, who was one of the creators of the LGBT History Project, Barry started the, the Gay Switchboard, and originally it was in a shed downtown. And it was a hotline that if people in the LGBT community needed help or felt they were in crisis, we would refer them to the crisis hotline or counseling hotline. We ourselves were not counselors. Mm -hmm. We were not social workers, but we would direct them, here's the appropriate agency for you to call. Or sometimes people would be visiting from out of town and just call and say, we're the, we're the bars. Mm -mm. So to me, given that it was such a conservative community, that in itself was a form of activism that you were working this telephone line in a shed in downtown Harrisburg. And um, Dignity sponsored trips to Gay Pride in New York. And once I went to New York to the first Gay Pride, I sort of felt empowered as a gay person that it's much greater than this little group of people in Pittsburgh. There are millions of us. And, and it was an amazing feeling. And so I did become more empowered to talk about gay, gay rights or what I thought should be my perception of what gay rights should be. And eventually, I, I started working for state government. Um, and when I, shortly after I worked for state government, friends in Pittsburgh were starting to die. And people would call from Kaufman's and say, Tom's in the hospital, he has this really weird pneumonia and they don't know what to do and blah, blah, blah. And I'd been reading all these articles in the Advocate magazine about people getting this really weird pneumonia and it was being called um, gay pneumonia and it was only affecting gay people. And at the time it was um, labeled by the medical community as GRID, and it was gay-related immune deficiency. So friends in Pittsburgh started dying. And I got a call one day, one of my best friends from Pittsburgh had moved to Manhattan, and two women we worked with in Pittsburgh married guys in Manhattan and moved to Manhattan. And they called and said, you need to come to New York. George is dying. He has this really weird pneumonia they don't know what to, there's no cure, there's, there are no drugs. As a result of that, I started getting really angry and wanted to know what was the government doing and came home and said to my partner one night, what's the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania doing about all these people who are dying from, from GRID? And he said, well, as a matter of fact, they're going to start an AZT program. And in 1986, 85, AZT was the only drug approved by the Food and Drug Administration that clinicians were starting to prescribe for people with HIV. So I said, how do I get the job? I want the job. I want to do that. I want to be the AZT guy. And he said, well, you have to go and talk to, and he gave me the person's name, found this woman. I, like, stalked her to find <laughs> where she was. 
knocked on her office door and said hi, heard about this AZT program, I want the job. I think it will be my way of helping the community by being a gay person on the inside government, the agency that is going to give them drugs. Mm -hmm. And she looked at me like I landed from another planet and said, it's civil service, have you applied for it? And I said, I'm applying for it now. And she said, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. Go to civil service, get an application, get it notarized, blah, blah, blah. So I did that. Uh, three weeks later, was called for an interview. Three weeks after that, she called and said, I really would like to hire you, but I don't know if I can, because 39 people applied for the job. All of them, except me, had experience in state government. State government's a very social, I mean, civil service is a very strange animal that you can be as incompetent as anything, but if you meet these strange criteria that have been established, you can get a job. And uh, so she said they have seniority, which gives them an upper edge. She said the thing that you have going for you is you were the only person out of all of them that wanted the job for what it is not because it was a promotion, because there's nothing to promote you from. <laughs> so I said, that's right, I want the job. And she said, well, they filed grievances. Some of the people had filed grievances that they were not hired. So I said, fine. Um, if you don't hire me, I'll file a grievance and say you didn't hire me because I'm gay. <laughs> and and she, <laughs> she was kind of speechless at that point. And I said, really, if you want... I will, I'll be real flamboyant about it. I'll put on a feather bow and some chandelier earrings and paint my nails and I will go with you to civil service and file a complaint. And she said, I don't think we need to be that radical. <laughs> Just give me a few weeks to work it out. Fortunately, she had recorded every single interview, took them to civil service and argued her point that out of all those people, I was the only one who wanted the job for what it was. So I think that was a turning point for me becoming a real advocate because I was able to see how government was going to treat gay people with a fatal disease. Because in 1987, if you were diagnosed with HIV, usually you're dead within a year. And it also turned out that the woman who did hire me gave me a lot of leeway. She was from Pittsburgh. She had relatives who, who owned a gay bar in Pittsburgh. So she completely got gay. And she was compassionate and really sympathetic for people who were dying from HIV. And a result let me do all kinds of advocacy work. She would, um, I would say there's, there's going to be a gay pride parade in Harrisburg. I wanna go and hand up pamphlets and she would say we don't have any money for you to do advertising and I would say that's fine you know I'll, I'll get them somehow and I would go to the uh, it wasn't Kinka then I forget what the copy shops were called and a friend of mine would do artwork and would do a flyer that would say free AZT call this number and I would go to Gay Pride at Reservoir Park in Harrisburg and hand out pamphlets and stuff and be an advocate that way. Ended up advocating uh, because of the drug program. That's what I did for 24 years. So it was quite a transition from working in a retail environment where the idea is to make money to working in an environment where I was giving money away mm -hmm. via the drugs. But it was an amazing, an amazing experience to be an advocate from inside the system. What sorts of things did you do um, for the community with that job? Well, I think probably the, the, one of the best things that happened was one of the very early aggressive advocacy groups with HIV was called ACT UP, and, and was the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. Philadelphia had one of the most vocal, aggressive chapters. And I think what helped being gay was I could say to them, I'm one of the good guys here. I'm on the inside just because I'm working for the Department of Welfare. Doesn't make me the bad guy. 
come to Harrisburg, let's figure out what we can do together. And it, was, and it turned out to be a real proactive arrangement because the gay community realized there was somebody in government that related to their preference and their disease and wanted to help. So, so that was pretty powerful stuff, um, building these liaisons between AIDS activists and gay activists, because not everybody who was an activist was infected, mm -hmm. um, and state government and networking and getting people to realize that there are some agencies that do have an open door and there are agencies that do get it. Mm -hmm. So, What sort of roadblocks did you hit? Churches, <laughs> trying to do outreach in the religious communities because they, and in the African American community. Even though there were a lot of African Americans who were infected, complete denial. And I would go to organizations in the African American community and say, hey, there's a program with here that can help you get drugs. And well, no, we don't have any of those people living here. And so that was a real roadblock as far as helping people get access to medication that they needed. And, and it, it was tough. Even though the African American community was invited to the table all the time um, to work and network and meet people here in central Pennsylvania, it just was not working. And you spent 25 years in this career, is that what you said? I earlier? did. Um, what were some of the changes that you saw, you know, when you first got oh, the job? Oh, wow. Well, for one thing, the formulary, meaning the list of drugs, okay. expanded from one drug, AZT, and by the time I left government service, we were providing more than 700 different drugs to people who had HIV or um, needed drugs for HIV, but they also needed drugs for the side effects of HIV or other medical conditions. Um, for example, there were some people who had HIV plus diabetes. So we were able to provide their HIV meds plus their diabetic meds. Mm -hmm. So that, that was a, a phenomenal thing. The other thing was people started to live longer, which was amazing. I mean, it was so, it was terrific to see people living longer and responding well to the new drugs that were being developed. And what about the community's um, views about HIV and AIDS? Great question, because it has completely fallen off the radar screen. Um, there's so much apathy, in my opinion, now about age, AIDS. Uh, the people don't support it. People are still getting infected. People are infected and don't know they're infected and not being tested. And, and it, I have a nephew who's 20, 25 now who had moved to Manhattan, and from the time he was a little kid, I suspected he was going to be gay. I just thought, one of these days. He moved to Manhattan, and I thought, oh, no. He's incredibly handsome, talented, good-looking guy. He's going to become Manhattan party boy, and he did. And almost three years ago, he called one day and said, hey, Uncle John, just wanted to let you know I tested positive. And I could have killed him. But he and his friends, their attitude is, it's okay if we get infected. The drugs are so much better. Wow. And I would say to them, maybe the drugs are better, but what if the government says, we're not going to pay for those drugs anymore? What if the government says, the Ryan White Care Act is being written out of the budget. We want to put the money into something else because AIDS isn't a big deal anymore. And he and his friends would say, oh, we didn't think about that. And I say, you need to think about that. So, but people are living longer and responding well. Um, my nephew's doing really well. Uh, the current clinical regime, if people can tolerate the drugs, they're down to one drug a day, one pill a day which is very different from 1987 when it was as many as 92 pills a day. So some people, um, the pill burden was literally 92 pills a day. And I don't know, there, I mean, there are people who can't take a 10-day prescription of antibiotics without choking. Mm -hmm. 
So it's hard to wrap your brain around 92 pills a day. Mm -hmm. so, so that's been encouraging. But the sad thing is that people are apathetic. And um, the first AIDS organization in Harrisburg was called SCAN, South Central AIDS Assistance Network. And every year there would be a walk on City Island, a fundraiser. Mm -hmm. That walk used to raise tens of thousands of dollars, uh, upwards of eighty or ninety thousand dollars. The last walk, I think, raised six thousand. So I, I think it shows a lot about where people's heads are about the disease. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, it's not a gay disease anymore. And I think that is another thing that affected apathy. Early on, gay people owned it, and they were angry, and they wanted to help their friends who were infected, um, and they wanted to do whatever they could do to provide funding so there were agencies for people to go to. The other thing that happened early on, um, a lot of the lesbians that we played volleyball with became the caregivers, and they started taking care of the guys who were infected. And they would cook meals for them or clean their homes or visit mm -hmm. or take them to doctor's appointments and things. And, and I think once the disease shifted out of the gay community into mainstream heterosexual uh, community, then people started to not talk about it as much. And it just became maybe an expectation that, well, I'm infected, so the government will pay for my drugs and take care of me, and I don't need to worry about it. So, so it's been a real interest. It's still going on. I still work with AIDS. What do you do now? I work as a consultant for the University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public Health uh, for the Pennsylvania Mid-Atlantic AIDS Education Training Center. And then I'm also working with a local lobbyist for one of the companies that makes AIDS drugs, just trying to keep an eye on government to make sure that they are providing ongoing new emerging therapies for people who are infected. Mm -hmm. How do you raise awareness in a community that doesn't seem to be concerned with it? You just keep talking about it mm -hmm. whenever and wherever you can. Um, I, this, because of um, some friends, I've been introduced to youth groups mm -hmm. in some of the local schools. And I take tons of condoms with me and say, it ain't over. The fat lady didn't sing. There's no vaccine. There's no cure until there is. And the downside of that is I gave that same lecture to my nephew when he was growing up. Mm -hmm. And when he did tell me he was infected and I was so, so angry, one of my friends from Pitt said, you have to understand the age difference. He's 22. You are 63 you know, at the time. And in his mind, you are the voice of an adult in a Peanuts cartoon, that you are wah, 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 wah. You are sound. You are no substance. You're just a sound. And so it's, it's hard, but you still got to keep talking to people about it. And uh, it's interesting. There's um, the Logo TV station on cable, which is all LGBT. Um, does terrific public service advertising about getting tested and getting out there. And the sad thing about that is I don't see those ads on the major networks, mm -hmm. which is really too bad because it hasn't gone away and people are still... I don't know that you will ever keep people from acting on their raging hormones. If you want to have sex, you're going to have sex. The point is getting people to have safe sex. So, what about the? Um, have you seen any major shifts within the LGBT community at large um, over the past? You know, here years? it's phenomenal. Really? I mean, people are out, people are open, people are talking about their sexuality. I think it's incredible. The LGBT Center has a storefront in downtown Harrisburg. It's phenomenal. That's great. Unlike the hotline that was operating in a shack in, in an alley with a telephone and a light bulb. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's emerged a lot. And, and uh, the other thing that I've observed, I don't know how true it is, but it seems as though young people don't care if there's a gay bar or not. When I was growing up, the gay bar was your haven. Mm -hmm. 
the place where you could go to to be with people who were like you, to feel safe, hang out, meet people, socialize, have a really good time. Um, and when you talk to the bar owners downtown, most of them will say, business is awful. And I think it's because young people don't feel compelled to have a gay specific bar that they can go to that they can go pretty much to any club and if you're gay fine if you're lesbian fine you know you just kind of blend in with all the other people who are at the bar you know and if people don't want to deal with it or talk about it leave it alone mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know how intense gay bashing is in the community anymore I, I haven't heard stories at least in this region of gay bashing that doesn't mean it doesn't happen i'm sure the kids that i've talked to the high school groups they are bullied and they do have classmates that bully them um, beyond that in the community i don't know mm -hmm. i haven't heard any stories of people being uh, abused or beaten up in downtown harrisburg and that did happen Really can't there, there was at one point, I think it was in the 80s, um, when people leaving the bars were being beat up and mugged and kicked. And mm -hmm. I think one of the bars even started providing whistles to people. So that you left the bar, you had a whistle with you, and if, if someone jumped you, you could blow the whistle and make all the noise you could possibly make uh, to get help. Mm -hmm. At least let people know something was going on. It shouldn't be going on. Were you ever involved in a situation like that? No. Yes. No. One of my roommates in Pittsburgh was beaten very badly in New York City um, and almost died. He was in the hospital for months and months. Uh, a gang jumped him and threw, they bashed his head in with bricks. And he was lucky that he did survive and did not have any brain damage after his recovery so but i've never personally you know been thank god been involved with it i think that'd just be awful mm -hmm. yeah do you still network um amongst organizations in the lgbt community today absolutely yeah with the lgbt center mm -hmm. downtown um i'm part of the committee for the project that the two of you are working <laughs> on so i'm involved with the history project mm -hmm. um, right now i'm trying to figure out how to use so social networking to find people who grew up here but now live in san diego sure. or live in chicago and my game plan is to just start working on facebook and, and because fa i love facebook some people will have 1400 friends and so I figure, okay, if you have 1,400 friends, if even 10% of them are LGBT, I wonder how many of that percentage grew up in central Pennsylvania and moved away. Mm -hmm. So I want to kind of experiment to see how can we network on Facebook or Twitter and reach out and have friends post a message to their friends and, and to keep spreading the word outward to see how many people we can get from central Pennsylvania, from New York to California. Mm -hmm. So I do work with the community that way. Why is the history project important to you? Oh, wow. Well, for one thing, it's important because we have lost such a huge chunk of it because of AIDS. We have lost two generations of people who died because they didn't respond to the drugs. So. I think the history of the remaining people, the living, is important. Whether or not they were infected um, is important. Um, how they grew up, how they were perceived growing up or what their experience, I think it's really important. Um, I think every little bit of exposure to teach people that we're normal people, we're just like everybody else. Um, we have jobs, we go to school, we pay taxes, we, we get sick and die, whatever your situation is, that we're all really very much the same except for who we want to sleep with. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And I think every bit of that exposure through the History Project helps teach people to be a little more accepting, a little more understanding of LGBT. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about you and your partner? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, we met, um, as I said, I was 20 when we met, um, and I had a fake ID. I was in a gay bar in Pittsburgh, <laughs> and we met in a bar. Um, went back to my apartment from the bar and just started seeing one another fairly often after that first encounter. And after about, I don't know, six or eight months, he said, why don't you move in with me? And I thought, mm, yeah, I like that idea. I'll move in with you. Um, so I moved in with him. I think why the relationship has endured for over 44 years is because we're completely different. <laughs> completely. Um, I did say that my dad never acknowledged gay, but he absolutely adored my partner because my partner did all the stuff I would not do. He would play golf, he would play bridge, he would play poker. Um, he was a high school and college jock. I could care less. You know, I'd rather be digging in the yard planting herbs or something than whacking a ball in a golf cart, golf course. Uh, so we're really, we're very different. He's nine years older than me. Um, he's very, very level-headed. I tend to react and then think about it after I've reacted and hash it over in my brain. And, and he's, he's real logical. I sometimes wonder if I have any logic at all. But uh, he's a great guy. He's really smart. Um, really smart. Uh, he's just, you know, low-keyed and, yeah. What were some of the hardships that you two faced um, early on in your relationship? Can't say that we really faced any. Mm -hmm. Because he was not out to any of his friends or family. And so there were, there were no negative interactions with family members. Although he has, he has one sister. And I think that she suspected that we were gay, um, but wouldn't talk about it. But I remember one time, um, they, they lived out of state and they were home visiting my partner's parents and his nephews were, I think, in high school. And my partner had said to his sister, you know, why don't you let the kids sleep over at the apartment tonight? And she would not let that happen. No, they're, no, they don't, no, they're staying at their grandmother's. And we were both pretty sure it was because she thought we would molest them or do something terrible because she's real homophobic. And uh, so that was a negative encounter. But he was never out to people he worked with. Never. Um, were you okay with that? Yeah. And I'm okay with any LGBT person who wants to do that because I think it's, it's who you are. And we each deal with our personal lives the way that we see best to deal with our own personal life. I'm comfortable being out. Mm -hmm. Now, I wouldn't um, want the whole neighborhood to know because there are people in the neighborhood I think would harm us or our property or that dog if they knew that we were gay. Um, there may be people in the neighborhood who suspect we're gay. Um, but it's, it's a good relationship. Yeah. Um, did he ever come out to his family? Never. Really? Never. Nope. Wow. And, and both of his parents are deceased. And his sister is still living. Um, she's in her 80s, lives in uh, Arizona. But no, never talked about it. And his, it's really interesting because he has an uncle that's gay. And his uncle and his partner have been together over 60 years. And I, I think they're just amazing guys. They're incredible. What's funny about them is they, they're from a generation, I think, when a lot of gay relationships were assigned um, gender roles. And so that one partner was always the more masculine partner and one was like the feminine one. Mm -hmm. and, and so I call them 
um, Uncle Mac and Aunt Ken. <laughs> so I refer to them. And Aunt Ken does a lot of things that you think would typically be a female role mm -hmm. in a household or relationship. Um, sewing, knitting, crocheting, cooking, um, canning, canning food and preserving food and making jam and jelly and uh, it, it's real, real interesting. I don't know other than my partner's dad once did say some comment about his brother-in-law and he said, well, you know, he's a little funny. But that was all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was the only comment. But I, I never heard either of my partner's parents say anything negative about gay people or, you know, you know just, or I should say evil. Mm -hmm. I mean, just saying someone's funny is negative. But um, I never heard them be overtly prejudiced or bigoted and saying they should be killed or locked up or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But no, his family is, he's one niece that knows. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. You know, she's, I think, in her 50s or 60s. She might be close to my age, but she's fine with it. So we just didn't talk about it, even. I was telling you earlier before we started that we adopted one another mm -hmm. a year ago because we are not confident the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania will approve same-sex unions in our life. And I, I wish they would stop calling it same-sex marriage. I think if advocates would call it same-sex union, it would be easier for people in this region to maybe start to understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, you say the word marriage and they immediately flip open the Bible and, mm -hmm. oh, well, no, marriage has to be a man and a woman and you know, it can't be two men, that's sick and stuff. Mm -hmm. And somehow calling it a union might work. Anyway, we adopted one another. Because my dad was still living at the time, I adopted my partner, which people thought was weird because he's nine years older. <laughs> and they thought, well, the father should be older than the child, but it didn't work out that way. But we adopted one another, and there was uh, the Central Voice newspaper did an article about the adoption. And my partner wanted to be pretty anonymous and mm -hmm. laid back primarily because of people he knows and works with and he plays golf probably three or four days a week when the weather's nice and has organized a senior golf group that is I'm positive 99.9% .9 heterosexual and he may be the only gay person I know that I know a lot of lesbians that golf. I don't know any gay guys that golf. It's very weird. I don't, I don't get the fascination with lesbians in golf. I really don't. Um, and I tease my lesbian friends about it all the time, about, you know, wh what is it with you and, you know, golfing? I just don't get it. But he's not out to any of, of those people that he golfs with. And when Frank wrote the article for The Central Voice, um, my partner would not allow his photograph to be taken for the article. And I kept saying to him, what are the chances that one, I, I call them geezer golfers, what are the chances one of the geezer golfers would pick up a Central Voice newspaper and read it and put two and two together? They don't know me. Yeah, they occasionally call her for something, some, the voice on the other end of the phone, but they don't know what I look like. Mm -hmm. They've never seen me. So, and they're never going to see me on the golf course. <laughs> Just forget it. <laughs> so. What was the process of adopting your partner like? Um, a lot easier than I anticipated. And a friend in Pittsburgh was really the impetus for it, for the adoption, because he called one day and said, congratulate me, I'm a father. And I said, what do you mean, Nino? You're 85 years old. <laughs> what do you mean you're a father? <laughs> And he said, I adopted Drew. And when he explained why he, the adoption because of inheritance tax, um, I thought that was incredible. So I said to my partner a couple of days later, Nino adopted Drew, and that's a really good idea. Why don't we do that? And he said, I've thought about that for years, but just never really mentioned it. 
And sure, I'll do that. So I called my attorney and said, you can, <clears throat> excuse me, start the paperwork for adoption. And she said, yeah. So she filed the papers with Dauphin County Court. Uh, we got a hearing date in adoption, the adoption court, and went downtown to the courtroom, judge, and that was it. They swore me in. The judge wanted to know what the rationale was. And I said, right now, it's the only option of protecting ourselves from Pennsylvania inheritance tax. I did not say one thing about same-sex marriage, same-sex union, nothing. All I said was inheritance tax. And that was fine. I didn't have to say anything more than that. So I was, you know, told thank you and go sit down. And they swore my partner in. And the judge said, do you agree with Mr. Fulby's rationale for adoption? My partner said, yes, absolutely. And the judge said, fine, that's it. He was released. Um, we were both sitting in there, you know, in the courtroom. And the attorney said, well, since we're all here and we're the only people here right now, would you sign the adoption forms to make it legal now rather than putting in a pile of paperwork and signing off later? And the judge said, sure. So he signed off on the adoption papers, then looked at me and said, Mr. Fulby, congratulations. It's a boy. <laughs> and, and it was a really good thing because it broke the ice for me. I was, I was really uptight about the whole process because I kept thinking, what if we get some Bible-thumping Pennsylvania judge who's going to say, no, you can't do this? I, I mean, I later found out from my attorney the judge couldn't have done that because there is nothing legal saying you can't do this. Mm -hmm. You know, that an adult may not adopt another adult. The other thing that I think is very interesting is the media got so focused on the fact that two older gay guys were doing this, I kept thinking, what a bunch of idiots. Straight people could do this too if they had a brain in their head. There, I know straight couples who've lived together for 30 and 40 and 50 years, and the partner will die, the surviving spouse has to pay 16% inheritance tax. Mm -hmm. So you're an idiot if you don't consider adoption as a way of protecting yourself from some of that financial burden. Why not? Mm -hmm. So the one thing the judge did say is, you realize this is final. You can't change it. So that if the Commonwealth would approve same-sex marriage, um, we couldn't get married. Um, I think that we probably could you know, if my partner would declare himself an emancipated minor, <laughs> that could end the adoption or someone else could adopt him, mm -hmm. which is legal. Someone else could adopt him and end this adoption and then we could get married. And the only reason we would do that is because now that the federal government is recognizing it, it would take advantage of some maybe tax benefits and survivor benefits. So beyond that, we don't feel compelled to have that hunk of paper. I mean, we, it's interesting. All three of my sisters have been divorced and remarried. My brother's still with his wife, his first wife. So, but I think it's amazing that our relationship has endured that long. And my three sisters have all, you know, so when legislators start stomping their feet about heterosexual marriage being so sanctimonious and perfect and wonderful, I think there's something wrong with this picture. Yeah. Look around you. How many divorce? The divorce rate is so incredibly high. What, what does that say about straight marriage? Mm -hmm. Of course, now it's happening in the gay and lesbian community. People who have gotten married are now getting divorces. Um, there have been a couple of articles in the New York Times about it about uh, LGBT divorces now and a whole new legal can of worms. Mm -hmm. You know, property and custody if you've adopted. And yeah. What were the reactions um, by people when you adopted your partner? <laughs> they were interesting. Um, I did tell Uncle Mac and Aunt Ken. 
And Uncle Mac just thought it was ridiculous. He just thought that was crazy. Everyone else that we did tell was really supportive. They thought it was a great idea and a really smart thing to do because of the rationale behind it, because of saving some tax liability. Mm -hmm. So they, they were supportive. Uh, Frank's article, Frank Pizzoli's article did reach mainstream media and a lot of media below the mason dixon line was very negative and hurtful and at one point I called Frank and said they wouldn't believe what they're saying. <laughs> you know, there was a website called Scared Monkeys and it was in Alabama or someplace and, and the feedback was just so negative. Mm -hmm. And it really freaked me out. Then there, there was a lot of feedback saying we, we were committing incest to the point where I thought, is that true? Because now we are father and son. Is this incest? Mm -hmm. And I called the attorney and said, could somebody really arrest us and say we're, it's an incestuous relationship? And she said they would have to have cameras in your bedroom, microphones. They would actually have to see you having sex mm -hmm. together before they could file charges of incest. Mm -hmm. So um, interesting feedback, Northeast, real supportive feedback from major cities was supportive. Feedback from European publications was supportive. It was everything below the Mason-Dixon line was just evil. Mm -hmm. I mean, just we would kill you if we knew where you lived. So, wow. how did that make you feel? Uh, it scared me at first, and I and I kept thinking, oh, was this a smart thing to do? Uh, telling Frank, yeah, let it go, let the story out there. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, yeah. You know, after Frank really reeled me in and said, stop reading it, mm -hmm. you know, just stop reading it. They, if they were smart, they could figure out who you are, um, but just leave it alone. And eventually it did, it did all just die down. Mm -hmm. It was an interesting experience though. Do you, does that happen a lot? Do a lot of partners adopt no. their partners? No. No. And I don't understand it because I, I've been chatting it up with all of the couples I know where the partners are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, one of the things I witnessed when people were dying from AIDS, if they were in a relationship, there were people who were losing their homes because the deceased partner's family would come in and say, well, this was my brother's house. And the surviving partner would say, yeah, but I helped buy it and I helped pay for half of the stuff that's in it. But unless there was a will, mm -hmm. those families have trumped all over the surviving partner. And it doesn't matter whether it was AIDS or what it was. It is still happening now that without a will or an adoption um, to protect you, that the deceased family could come in and say, get the hell out, leave. Um, one of the women you interviewed recently had good friends and the elder partner died last fall. And his family came in and said to the survivor, you have three months to get out of here. Even though he helped buy that house mm -hmm. and all of the things in it, too bad. The family said, no, it was our brother we're family, we are legally entitled to whatever was his. Wow. So I think people are really foolish if they don't look into adoption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I, I think I actually take adoption over marriage. Really? Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, because it is an option right now mm -hmm. and because the Commonwealth drags its feet on anything dealing with sexual preference. I mean, the Commonwealth, fortunately, there is a law that people who work for the Commonwealth are protected if they're LGBT. They cannot be fired uh, because of sexual preference or sexual choices. And I don't know how many other states have that for state employees, but at least Pennsylvania does. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know about you know, how many people are thinking about adoption. and. and bouncing around here but yeah 
Are you I, still pretty confident that the Commonwealth will not approve? I am. You are? Yep. I really, and it's funny because a lot of my friends think it's going to happen any day now. And I keep thinking, no, it isn't. And it's sad because the Commonwealth has been the leader on so many different initiatives. And I don't know, our legislators just are still stuck in the mud somewhere and cannot get it around their brains. And, and it's probably a lot of it has to do with their constituents. Uh, Pennsylvania is the largest rurally populated state in the country. Texas has more rural land mass, but it's not populated. Pennsylvania has more regions that are designated rural that are populated. Mm -hmm. So I think legislators from the rural areas where people tend to be a little more conservative and uptight, listen to feedback from their constituents. And they know that, oh, well, you know, Frank and Helen don't want that to happen, mm -hmm. so we're not gonna let that happen. So we're not gonna let the queers have a union, so. I don't wanna end the interview without talking about, I looked you up online, and I found that there's actually a John Fulby Award. And <laughs> I think that that's remarkable. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Wow. <laughs> I'm amazed you did that. It was, yeah. Can we delete this part? Sure. Do you want me to stop the camera? <laughs> For a minute? Sure. Yeah, I, I did get an award. The, um, actually, it, it did knock me out. A former Secretary of Public Welfare, a woman named Karen Snyder, called one day. And, and she's a very gruff lady. And, and first of all, it freaked me out that she called. Mm -hmm. And she said, Fulby. <laughs> yes, yeah, this is Karen Snyder. And I said, oh, hi. <laughs> and, I, and I'm thinking, and she has left state government. She works for public service. Uh, she's still in public service. I forget the agency she's with. I think helping kids. And she said, I need your curriculum vitae. And I thought, <laughs> Okay, what's this all about? And I said, are you going to recommend me to do some lobbying or something? And I was thinking that's, you know, why would she possibly need my CV? Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, but it's not quite up to date. There's some new things I'm doing with the University of Pittsburgh. And I need, mm -hmm. you know, I've retired and about to retire. I need to refresh it. And she said, okay, but get it to me. I need it by 2 o'clock this afternoon. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, lady, what is this? And she said, well, I'm nominating you for an award. And they need the information by 2 o'clock. And I don't nominate people for awards unless I'm absolutely sure they're going to get the award. And I'm thinking, yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, this is just so bizarre. So we hung up. I pulled my CV together, updated it with current, a few current blobs, and emailed it to her. And... A month later, got a phone call that said, we're going to honor you uh, for your work with HIV mm -hmm. and enabling people to move forward with their lives with HIV. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was awarded by um, the Foundation for Enhancing Communities. Mm -hmm. And HIV AIDS was one of their core causes to support. And, and it was amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, there are people that get the John Fulby Award every year. Oh, that's a different award. That's a different award. <laughs> so what is that award about? Uh, that award, oh, that really blew me away. Um, <laughs> wow. That award was from an AIDS fundraiser called mm -hmm. the Black and White Party. Uh -huh. And I was still working for state government. Mm -hmm. And one of the social workers from one of the AIDS clinics that I worked with in New York called and said, oh, we're doing a fundraiser, and would you, would you support it? And I said, sure, I'll buy a ticket. Um, because if it was a local fundraiser, I would try to support it and buy a ticket uh -huh. and attend it. Um, I would get a lot of invitations from Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and uh, Erie to please mm -hmm. come to our AIDS fundraiser, but it was not, not an easy thing to do. 
So if it was local, I said, yeah, I'll do it. And, and David said, oh, you know, don't worry. We're going to, you know, get a ticket for you. We're just happy that you're going to come. And I said, no, you know, I'll send you a check. So I wrote them a check, you know, and he said, well, you can, he called a couple of days later and said, you can pick it up at the will call table. It's going to be at this <laughs> club in York. And I said, fine. So um, I'm thinking, okay, black and white party. Of course, you have to think, you know, black and white clothing and the whole, what do I do here? So I went, drove to York. There were like 1,200 people there. It was huge. There were tents on the parking lot of this nightclub and just a million people. And I thought, God, this is really, this is a really big deal. I'm really surprised. So I'm schmoozing with people I know and circulating and talking to people and there were a ton of doctors from the clinic that I had talked with on the phone but had never met. They were all there and all yakking and stuff and the evening's going on and at one point um, a master of ceremony said if everyone would please come into the club uh, we want to introduce Jenny McCarthy and you know, she's going to talk about Family First Health and the work they do. That was the name of the agency. Okay. And they have a short video presentation about the clients and the doctors and the facility and da 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 And on and on. And then she finished and she said, oh, and if John Fulby's in the room, would you please come up here? And that was it. They gave me an award. Really? Could not stop crying. I was so overwhelmed. Sure. When you work for state government, you really don't think people will acknowledge your work. Mm -hmm. So I'm sobbing my guts out. I could hardly talk. I mean, it was a mess. And I looked out of the side of my eye and there was a six foot four drag queen headed toward me in a red sequin gown and earrings down to here and gloves <laughs> up to here and bracelets. And this drag walked over to me and he grabbed me and gave me this humongous bear hug mm -hmm. and said, honey, I just want to tell you things. <laughs> and I said, well, thank you. And, and I said, for what? And he said, well, if it wasn't for your drug program, I couldn't have afforded all this. <laughs> and, and it was a perfect thing to happen because I couldn't get a grip on myself. Sure. And it just brought me all down to, yeah. Um, but they named the award after me so that whoever receives it from that point on will receive the John Fulby Award for Excellence. So, and the people I've gotten it are all people that I would say absolutely, they, they've been on the front lines, given a zillion percent to helping people with HIV and mm -hmm. yeah, so. That must be an incredible feeling. Yeah. That's quite an honor. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> uh, we can wrap yeah, it up. You really knocked me out with that because I was like, uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, I didn't. Uh, yeah, that I, I don't think about those things. Sure. I mean, it was it was um, amazing. Yeah. Sure. Um, if there's anything else that you'd like to share with me, I'd like to give you the opportunity. I'm just trying to think. I, you know, I just I hope I'm hopeful that the history project. Well, we, we should do a segment that is just on how HIV did and has affected two generations of the community that our histories we will only know antidotally from friends who were friends of the friends who died. And because of HIV, we have lost huge blocks of archival material and legislation, copies of legislation that um, there was a man from Pittsburgh named Roger Beatty and he and Dr. Tony Silvestri from Pitt were instrumental in writing the legislation for civil rights and for state employees who are LGBT and Roger died a year ago almost two years ago and unfortunately his family didn't think about it and all of his files and papers and everything were just put in a dumpster. So there's a lot of history that's missing because people didn't know about it or weren't aware of it or people didn't come out to their families mm -hmm. and couldn't tell them about the work they did or things they accomplished 
for the LGBT community and that's lost. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm hopeful that people who hear about the project, even if they don't want to be photographed, will at least do a verbal history sure. that it can be recorded and hopefully people will learn from it. Mm -hmm. So as we all continue to move forward. Sure, what else do you think needs to be done? for the LGBT community? Wow. I think education really is crucial. Um, that it can't be swept under the rug because it's not gonna go away. Mm -hmm. And I just, I'm hopeful that at some point people will stop being judgmental of diversity and embrace diversity for what it is, whether it be your culture, your sexual preference, your religion. Just let it go. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Thank you so much. Thank I you. I appreciate it. <laughs> I really do. You got me. <laughs> <laughs>